Okay, so hello everybody, I'm happy to have along with us. Uh, Alan Cohen is a senior lecturer at uh, the School of uh, Electrical <laughs> Engineering at Tel Aviv University. He received his PhD in 2019 from the Technion, uh, where his advisor was Professor Kamil Hazan. Uh, till now, uh, Alan was a research scientist at Google uh, Research at Tel Aviv at the foundation of the NL team under the leadership of Professor Ishai Mansour. Uh, and today he will speak with us about uh, online market decision processes with aggregate bandit feedback. So Alon, the stage is yours. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so uh, so I'm, I'm, this work I did uh, while I was still full time at Google, but uh, actually now I'm a senior lecturer at uh, electrical engineering. Um, and what this talk is generally about, it's about um, taking tools from online learning and applying them in problems in RL. Okay, this is the general setup. I'm going to uh, give a brief overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, set up a poll and tell, tell you what the results are in high level. Then I'm going to, most of the talk is going to be about uh, background in reinforcement learning and online learning. And then I'm going to show you how we can use this, uh, these uh, tools to solve uh, the problem that you wanted. Okay. So, as I said, my research deals with this intersection between reinforcement learning and online learning. Namely, we have some decision-making model that you want to be able to learn and interact with uh, approximately optimally. Uh, and we want to do it uh, as efficiently as possible. Um, and sometimes we even want to do it while we make uh, um, as little as, as, as some assumptions as we can about the model. And this is where online learning comes in. So uh, for those of you who don't know uh, online learning, so the, the, the standard way that we usually think about learning, about statistical learning, is that we get a training set, we, uh, we uh, uh, learn some classifier or some regression model, and then the learning stops and we apply this classifier indefinitely. And this has a very strong underlying assumptions that, assumption that what we saw in the past is going to reflect what we will see in the future. Uh, and this is something that online learning uh, attempts to rectify. And the idea is that learning never stops. We always continue to learn. And by doing so, we can, we, uh, we can avoid the uh, statistical assumptions about the way that we get the data. Um, and this is especially relevant in uh, tasks where uh, we can't make uh, like IID assumptions, such as uh, the stock market, for example. Um, the the problem with the, this model is that it makes um, myopic decisions. The decision that I'm making at time t will not affect the way that the environment behaves or, or uh, the learning task that I want to uh, learn in time t plus one. Um, and uh, many tasks such as say playing games, uh, playing Go or playing chess, like if I move uh, the bishop from uh, one uh, one uh, square to another square in, on the board, it's going to, to affect the, the way that the game is going to develop. Uh, and this is modeled by a reinforcement learning, um, where the, the idea is that we have some model of the world and we want to be able to make long-term decisions. So maybe I'm going to make a decision now that's going to be bad for me, uh, but in the future, I'm going to enjoy high reward somehow, okay? Um, and I, I want to be able to sort of uh, account for that. Um, one of the main issues when, with um, reinforcement learning in practice is this problem of uh, sparse rewards. Um, and uh, like one of the uh, main, um, main uh, uh, data sets that uh, DeepMind and such uh, evaluate on is, uh, is, um, uh, is Atari games, where you have uh, uh, an emulator of Atari 2600, 
you uh, you feed your model with the pixels of the screen that uh, Atari shows, and the model has to tell you which key on the on the Atari keypad you need to press. And for a very long time, this game, uh, this very old game called Montezuma's Revenge, was a very hard problem. Um, and the reason is that this the, the idea behind the game is that it's a, it's a maze. You need to go from one screen to another. In most screens, nothing happens, okay? You, can, you have to avoid some traps or something like that. But once in a while, on you know, some screens, there's, say, a key or a sword or something that we, I need to pick up. And this gives me a, a score. So my reward here is very, very, very sparse. Um, and one of the ways to, that people in practice um, get around sparse rewards, which um, oh, okay. First of all, why sparse rewards are bad? Because if I try different actions or different things uh, in the game, uh, I'm not going to see some, any reward for a very long time, and it's going to uh, make learning very, very slow. Um, so, so now, uh, what people do in practice is they, um, they assume that there's some intrinsic reward that's not the actual reward, but it's some reward function that's going to sort of help me learn how to play the game. So for example, in, in, in chess, I know there's a huge literature about how you, to construct these intrinsic rewards. So for example, if I'm, um, if I'm one step away from, uh, I'm not sure what the English term is, um, one step away from uh, um, uh, taking the queen, or, uh, or if I make uh, uh, these or other um, uh, moves. Um, but uh, nowadays in practice, actually people learn this intrinsic reward. Um, and the, the problem that I'm going to talk about is one way to model uh, uh, how we can learn these intrinsic rewards without actually assuming that they're, that they're, um, that they're there explicitly. Um, and generally, um, I'm going to discuss this model of online Markov decision processes, uh, where I have a finite horizon Markov decision process. So I make um, um, every, every time step, I see the current state of the system. I take an action, and then the next state is chosen at random. And I'm going to do this for exactly H time steps. And once the episode, once the episode ends, once the H time steps uh, are finished, then I'm going to see the, re the loss or the reward that, uh, that I got uh, during the episode. And uh, my, um, my goal here is to minimize my regret over capital K episodes, uh, where the regret is the total loss that my learning algorithm suffers, minus the total loss that I would have gotten had I played optimally from the start, knowing what the uh, losses are going to be. Um, so in, in this work, we study online Markov decision process, processes with uh, unknown dynamics. So the way that uh, I'm moving from one state to another, to another is fixed and unknown. And the losses change are changed by an adversary. Um, the learner observes aggregate bandit feedback. What this means is that once the episode ends, the, the only feedback that the learner gets is the sum of the losses along the trajectory on the MDP. She doesn't get to see anything else, uh, specifically not the individual losses uh, along the state's actions uh, she observes on the trajectory, in the trajectory. Um, the, this is an, an extension from the case of stochastic losses to uh, adversarial losses. And our result is a computationally efficient algorithm that attains an optimal root K regret. Yes. So unknown un 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 dynamics are, um, are uh, usually what you want to deal with. Uh, many times you even know the rewards of the losses uh, from the start. Here, uh, we, we do want to somehow model the, the way that, the, that you have sparse rewards. Okay, so we just assume that you see 
the sum of the, the, the intrinsic rewards in the end of the episode. And they don't have to be like modeled stochastically or adversarially or anything like that. You just need to evaluate the learner's behavior uh, somehow along the episode. Okay. Um, okay, so I know a lot of people don't know anything about online learning. They, uh, they've heard about MDPs, but they don't know much about it. So now I'm going to give a, a, a brief background on both, uh, both uh, topics, and then I'm going to display the results. So uh, any other questions so far on the setup? Yeah. Um, okay. So, in reinforcement learning, you can think about it as this setup. So, I have a learner and some environment. That usually, people assume that is a Markov decision process. And the idea is, I uh, observe the state of the system, then I take an action, uh, and then the system transitions uh, to the next state. And I suffer a, a loss function that's a, a function of the current state and the action that I chose. Um, and my goal here is to minimize some measure of the overall cost. And uh, there are a bunch of different measures that you can think of. And the idea is that I have to learn how the environment behaves in order to do so. Um, so a Markov decision process or an MDP is this that decision decision making process that I described in the last slide, except it's it's Markovian. What does it mean? It means that once I get to some state and some time step, it doesn't matter how I got there. Like it's the the next the next state and the loss are independent of the history of how I got to, to where I am. And intuitively what this means is that everything I need to know about the environment. Uh, is in the way that the state is modeled and the number of time step um, within the MDP. Uh, at, at every time step you get a reward, but usually this reward is zero. But once in a while, it's something that's not zero. Okay, so it's not based on all the reports No, no, no. We, I, we do assume this uh, Mar Mar Markov uh, property. Um, and why people look at, uh, at MDP is because they're very easy to work with. Yeah, that's the main, uh, the main reason. Um, here, the, the, uh, as I said, there are a lot of types of MDPs. And here we, we look at the finite horizon MDPs that are episodic and the interaction holds for exactly H time steps. Um, um, finite horizon MDPs are very uh, simple to analyze theoretically, usually. And, uh, and also, uh, uh, many times you can reduce other types of MDPs to finite horizon MDPs, um, just as a, as a side note. Um, as I said, my goal is to find some way of minimizing the expected total loss along the episode. And wh when I know how the next state is chosen and how the loss, what the loss is, I can find the the optimal policy very easily. I just do it with dynamic programming. So I look at the last time step. For every state, I can find the optimal action. Then I look at the second to last time step and find the optimal action that minimizes the, her, the, that's lost plus the future loss that I get and so on. Uh, and what you can see is that this policy is stationary and deterministic, meaning it's uh, a fixed function of uh, of the state of the sorry okay. it's the fixed function of the state so given the state i know ex what exactly what action i need to play and it's independent of the history so it's a function basically from 
state and time step to an action. That's the way that you, you have you can think about it. No, it's fixed and unknown. And but the losses do change. The losses do change. And you don't know anything. No. Except, uh, except that they're bounded. Um, so in RL, we want to learn the model, and there are a bunch of different RL tasks that you can think of. One such task is regret minimization in Markov decision processes. And the idea here is that we observe the state, we choose an action, and we don't know how we got to the next state. And we get some, if the loss is stochastic, we see the, some sample of the loss, or we see the loss in hindsight, and so on. The idea here is that um, we have to mitigate between exploration and exploitation. So we want to minimize our loss, but we also want to learn the environment in such a way that we approximate the optimal policy. Um, uh, uh, this problem was initiated in this paper by uh, Jacques Oyer and Otno. Um, as I said, our goal is to minimize the regret, the total loss of the learner minus the total loss of the optimal policy. Um, and the case of adversarial loss, uh, losses was first uh, considered by this paper by Noy, and uh, the best known upper bound for the tabular case, meaning uh, a finite the number of st states and actions, is uh, this bound, um, which is, by the way, probably not optimal. Okay, so any questions about RL? H is the horizon, S is the number of states, A is the number of actions, and K is the number of episodes. Okay. Um, okay, so in online learning, we want to learn continuously against an adversary that generates the losses for us. Uh, one such uh, online learning task is that of online linear in optimization where the losses are linear. So for capital T time steps, I predict some yt from some decision set S that you can, it can be anything, but uh, for uh, here we assume it's uh, some convex set in, um, in RD. And then the adversary reveals a, a, a loss vector in RD and we suffer the inner product between our prediction yt and the loss lt, which we assume is bounded. And similarly, the goal is to minimize the regret, which is our total loss minus the total loss of the best fi fixed y in our decision set s. Uh, you can assume different types of feedbacks, but uh, here you can consider bandit feedback, meaning the, the only uh, information that we have about the loss is this inner product between yt and lt, which is our loss. And our goal is to uh, attain an optimal root uh, t regret, which is the number of uh, total time steps. So the bandit feedback assumption is that we only see what we, we don't know what we lost. No. That's what the bandit is. Uh, yeah, you can think of like different types of uh, limited information models, but uh, in this one, you, you, you observe your own loss. Yeah. Okay. Um, so th there are uh, different algorithms that you can use to uh, learn in the bandit feedback model. One such algorithm is online mirror descent. Uh, so to understand online mirror descent, think about gradient descent first. Where in gradient descent, I just take my current iterate xt and I uh, um, subtract the loss my time, some time step parameter eta. Um, so a mirror descent is just a generalization of gradient descent. Um, as an intermediate step, you can think about the half uh, L2 norm squared. And here we just take the gradient of this function at xt plus one 
and set it to be the gradient of the function xt minus the loss. But half norm squared is just an arbitrary function, so I can just put whatever I want there, right? And this is this is mirror descent, okay? The choice of this function r is very, very important, especially for banded feedback, but this is a general algorithm. And then you just about Sorry? To get xt plus one. You need to invert the gradient. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's important that the gradient will be invertible. This doesn't always hold. Um, so so uh, to analyze uh, mirror descent, you, uh, we need to consider this quantity, this, this Bregman divergence, which you can just think of it as a distance function between some y and x. Okay, it depends on it's, it's the difference between uh, r at y uh, and the linearization of r at x at y. Um, so it, it's, it gets larger as, as r has more and more curvature. Uh, and, and general results say that uh, the regret of, um, of mirror descent scales like the initial distance between x1 and my uh, and the best uh, uh, u in hindsight uh, times one over the time step. So this is exactly like in gradient descent. Right? It depends where I start. If I start close to, to optimal, then I can learn very quickly. But if I'm far away, I need to uh, do some more work. Plus some term that scales with the distance between xt and xt plus 1. So usually, um, this initial distance is some, I can bound it with some constant because I assume my decision set is bounded. And I can, if R be, sort of behaves nicely, I can bound this distance between xt and xt plus one by some eta time, some norm of the loss squared, which as usually, usually people assume is bounded. So it's just uh, an order of the time step. So all in all, I get, something that looks like one over eta plus eta times the number of time steps. And if I optimize over eta, I set eta to be order of one over root t, I get the root t regret that I want. Okay. Um, so th this is without assuming anything about the feedback, right? That I know anything about the loss function. So what do I do when I have bandit feedback? I need to consider a very specific R. Um, one such R that I uh, can think of is uh, what's called the self-concordant barrier. Self-concordant barriers are everywhere in, uh, in convex optimization and interior point methods, uh, but it turns out that they're very, very useful for, uh, for um, linear bandits as well. And the, uh, the specific definition doesn't really matter. It's just a function that uh, is very, very smooth and uh, it's defined on my decision set and it sort of explodes on the boundary of the decision set. Um, so um, and a very nice property that you can, um, that the uh, self control barriers have is that you can use the Hessian of the, the barrier to define an, a, a norm. It's called a local norm with respect to some point x in my uh, set s. So given this local norm, if I take some point uh, x in, in, in s and I look at the, at the unit ellipsoid of the, the unit norm around x, according to the local norm, it's contained in my set s. Okay, so it's a, it's a very, very uh, special property that's very, very useful. And th this ellipsoid is called the Dickin ellipsoid. Another very nice property that uh, is going to appear in the, one of the last slides uh, is this one, that you can always low bound the Bregman divergence with the self concordant barrier between any two points in my set S with this local norm uh, distance between y and x. And this is up to some uh, constants, both additive and multiplicative.
Um, this is, by the way, a, a very, very um, weird property. Uh, usually, uh, you have norm squared over there. But here, somehow, magically, we get uh, this term. Uh, so some examples of self-concordant barriers. So over the um, uh, non-negative reals, you can take minus log of x. Uh, if you have some half space, uh, eight, eight uh, times x uh, is less than less or equal than b, and then you can take minus minus log b minus a times x. Uh, you can sum self-concordant barriers and get a barrier over some polytope. Um, over PSD matrices, you can take a minus log determinant. But generally, um, any convex set function um, in, in uh, any convex, a convex set in RD has an order of D self concordant barrier. Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, result. But we also, in practice, we also need to be able to compute this barrier efficiently, which doesn't always happen. OK, so how can, how can I use self-concordant barriers to get um, regret for uh, linear bandits? Um, I can do the following. Um, the idea is that I do mirror descent using this barrier R. But at any point xt, my prediction is a sample, that's, uh, a sample yt that's taken uniformly from the Dickin ellipsoid around xt. Then I observe the inner product, the loss between yt and lt. And then I can construct an unbiased estimate of the loss lt. Um, don't, don't, worry, don't worry about this, uh, this quantity. I'm going to show you why it's unbiased in the next slide. Um, once I have this, uh, this estimate, I can, um, I can do the mirror descent step using the estimate of the loss. Um, uh, even if this estimate is un unbiased, it's not clear why this thing should work, right? It can be, even if it's unbiased, it can be very, very large. Um, but as you, as you will soon see, it will still work out. Okay. Uh, so your iterates are xt. Yeah, exactly. OK, so um, why is it unbiased? So first of all, let us write yt, which is a uniform, uh, sampled uniformly from the Deakin ellipse around xt, as just xt plus Hessian at r xt minus half times ut, where ut is uh, distributed uniformly from the unit sphere. It will just make uh, life easier for us uh, in the analysis. Uh, and then I can look at this quantity u y t transpose, which I can uh, replace uh, y t with um, uh, what I wrote in the previous line. And if you open this quantity and get anything that's, uh, that's um, not random conditioned on, on the history, then I can get this term. And the, uh, ut is distributed from the unit sphere. So the expectation of ut is just 0. And the expectation of ut, ut transpose is 1 over d identity. And uh, if I, um, if I uh, um, write down, then I get 1 over d times the Hessian at uh, uh, r minus half. OK, so now, uh, why is uh, the loss unbiased? So I write the definition of the loss and replace yt with um, xt minus Hessian at minus half ut. And I get this quantity. Then I can take out of the expectation anything that's not random conditioned on the history. And I get this term. So now all I have to do is take expectation about uh, 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 on u uh, yt transpose which we know is uh, one, of the D, 1 over d Hessian minus half. And then d and minus d are canceled out. And the Hessian is canceled out. And then I uh, get LT. OK. So, uh, so why do I get root t regret? 
first of all, uh, let us know that the algorithm is efficient as long as, as, long as I can take, um, as long as I can compute R efficiently, both the gradients and the Hessian of R. Um, so with online mirror descent, I get this uh, guarantee on the regret. Well, previously we had here the, the Bregman distance between xt and xt plus one, which I can upper bound by the dual, no, dual local norm squared of in uh, LT. And the dual norm is just defined with uh, the Hessian inverse except, uh, instead of the Hessian. So it's just the dual of a matrix law. And then by, by the way that we sampled the, the, the unbiased estimates, they're bounded in this uh, dual local norm. And also um, if you uh, sort of bang on it enough, you can get a, a bound on the initial distance between U and X1. Um, and tune eta, and you can get uh, this, uh, this regard bound. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Uh, okay, so why does this help me solve the initial problem that I started with? So first of all, uh, we start by doing the following. We, take, we start with the problem of online NDPs and we reduce it to on, online linear optimization. And the way that we do it is using occupancy measures. How do occupancy measures work? So think about the total expected loss over some policy in my model. I can uh, write this uh, expectation of the sum as just sum over the time steps, states, and actions of the loss times the probability of visiting this state action um, in, in, um, in time step H, given my policy and the dynamics of the model. And now I can take this list of probabilities and write them as a vector, okay? This vector is what we call an occupancy measure. And as it turns out, um, this was proven in this paper by Rosenberg and Matsu, uh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between an occupancy measure and some fixed policy, as well as dynamics of the model. So given a policy in dynamics, I know what the occupancy measure is, it's very easy, but also you can take the occupancy measure and find what the policy and dynamics were that generated it. Um, so now uh, the, the, my total loss is just a linear function between the loss as a vector over its states and time steps and actions and the occupancy measure. And I can use uh, online linear optimization techniques to uh, get uh, a bounded regret. To assume a more. Yeah, but this also works for linear MDPs, by the way. For linear MDPs, it works as well. Uh, uh, it's just uh, that you can um, write the, um, the, the um, if you have uh, some feature space of, of the state and actions as a vector, you can write the loss and the dynamics as a linear function of the, that embedding. Um, okay, so in aggregate bandit feedback, we have. So, so yep. Uh, yeah, we did that in a, pre in a previous paper. Uh, it just. Um, it, it only works with quadratic functions, quadratic losses. And then your, the occupancy measure is a PSD matrix that sort of uh, represents the covariance steady state matrix of the states and actions. It's a, it's sort of a vector, it's, it's a matrix, but it's the same idea. Um, so, so yeah, with aggregate bandit feedback, I can use adversarial linear bandit algorithm to get uh, Ruti regret. But this is, once again, assuming known dynamics. Okay, so what happens when the dynamics are unknown? This is where things get interesting. 
when the dynamics are unknown, I can choose a, an occupancy measure, but it will be inaccurate. It won't represent the true dynamics of the model that I want to optimize. Um, so what I can do is that I can split the episodes into epochs. In each epoch, I have a set of all the sort of feasible occupancy measures, right? So given the observations that I had about the model, I can try and estimate the dynamics and then I can see, and then, um, sorry, and then uh, build uh, some confidence set around the dynamics and take all the occupancy measures that are, uh, that, whose dynamics are within this confidence set. And um, um, so in each, in each epoch, I can run my online optimization. And then once the epoch ends, I re-estimate the dynamics and restart the algorithm. And the number of epochs is, uh, is small, so it's still fine. Um, right, so given this uh, set of sort of uh, set of occupancy measures, I can choose one. It will reflect some policy and some dynamics that aren't uh, usual, will probably not be the true dynamics of the model, but I can take this policy out of the occupancy measure and execute it in the real model. Um, and then I can observe the trajectory that the policy generated. And the loss that I suffered is this uh, a linear product. So it should be L, not L tilde. Uh, an inner product of the loss with the occupancy measure of the same policy, but with the true dynamics of the model. Okay, so I choose some prediction, some vector, and then I play some other vector. Uh, how, how, do, how do I sort of account for that? Uh, as it turns out, it, with, with the aggregate bandit feedback, it's even worse because now I have a bias in my estimate of the loss, right? If I had yt here, this would be unbiased, but I don't. I have some other uh, vector which represents, this represents the trajectory that I saw in the MDP. Okay, so, um, first of all, let me frame the problem. So instead of reducing to adversarial inner bandits, I'm going to reduce to a, a different setup, a novel setup that's called distorted linear bandits. In distorted linear bandits, I have some uh, convex set S. I choose a vector in yt in this convex set. This will be uh, some occupancy measure. And then an adversary observes yt and it shifts it to some zt and the adversary doesn't tell me what zt is. But I know that zt is somehow close to yt in terms of this epsilon. Um, so I don't see zt, but I see some sample z hat that's zt in expectation. And this represents the trajectory of my policy in, in the true MDP. Then I observe the loss according to Z hat, and I observe this um, error term epsilon. And my goal here is to minimize the regret, but unlike the previous definition, here I want to minimize the loss according to this Z hat, which I don't really have control of. So in general, there's nothing that I can do. But if this a quantity is bounded, so then the, the way that the error scales, the total error scales is bounded, then I can show that uh, I can still get root T regret. Okay, so the, um, the setup is clear. Okay, so given this, the reduction between my original problem and distorted linear bandits, all that I have to do now is to show you uh, an algorithm that gets rooty for distorted linear bandits. Um, okay. And actually, um, we were stuck on this problem for a very long time because we had an inefficient algorithm and we banged our head uh, against it. Uh, um, um, until it didn't get us anything. And then just by chance, I got across this uh, literature on, on a mirror descent with increasing learning rates, 
which turns out solves everything uh, by magic somehow. And you will see what I mean. Um, if, you, if you're familiar with online learning or with convex optimization, the SGD and so on, you know that you never increase the learning rate. You either keep it fixed or it decreases like one of the root uh, uh, t, a couple, uh, small t. There's absolutely no reason to increase the learning rate. And here you will see it just somehow works out. Um, right, so the algorithm is based on the adversarial linear bandwidth algorithm that we saw before. Right, I start from some barrier on my decision set. I, uh, uh, I have an iterate xt. I choose a uh, yt from uh, the Dickin ellipse around xt. Then I construct this estimate, and this estimate is biased, right? Doesn't reflect the true loss. But before I use this estimate, I take the learning rate and I increase it slightly. And th this increment is scales with the shift between yt and zt. Uh, and then I uh, take uh, the mirror descent step with respect to my loss estimate, which is biased, and the slightly higher learning rate uh, that I tuned. Right, because you want to uh, minimize the loss. Yeah. Yeah, ah, okay, sorry. Yeah, I was looking at the wrong line. <laughs> it, uh, it just uh, it lo looks nicer like this, I think. <laughs> um, okay, so recall the previous bound that we had using mirror descent. Now I have a very similar bound, right? The uh, first and last terms were there before, but now I have this new term. And this new term, as long as the learning rates are increasing, is negative. And also, the, if, this, uh, if my distance between the optimal occupancy measure and the one that I'm currently playing is very, very large, then this thing can be very, very large. Um, recall that the, the barrier sort of explodes on the boundary of my decision set. Right, so if I'm very, very close to this boundary, this can, this can be huge. This can be like capital T uh, or even larger, I think. Um, so why does this thing uh, help me? Before I tell you why, um, um, I show this lemma that we bound the instantaneous regret at time T by the regret using the estimated loss plus this bias term that scales with the arrow between yt and zt, and the distance in the local norm between xt and my comparator x. And also recall that we have this low bound between the Bregman divergence and, uh, and, the, um, and the, the local norm distance. So all I have to do now is just combine these three lemmas and the way that uh, we increase the learning rate. And I get that the the bias term is canceled out by this negative term in the, in the regret. This, this is complete magic. And I, I have no intuition to why this happens. What's even stranger, I think, is that the learning rate isn't large, right? It's just within a factor of two of my initial learning rates. It, the only thing that helps me is the increment itself. It's not that the learning rate is large. Uh, so Shai, if you have some intuition for that, I'll be happy to hear. Um, and the rest of the proof just follows from uh, the proof of the original algorithm. Okay, so uh, back to the original problem. There are a few technical details uh, that are missing. First of all, we have this uh, set of occupancy measures. We can easily s show how to construct a, a self-concordant barrier on this set that's uh, efficiently computable. Uh, we have this bound on B uh, that scales with the number of state sections and uh, time steps. And we can we show how the reduction between uh, the original setup and distorted linear bandits can be also done efficiently. 
all in all, with the regret bound that I got from, uh, from these total linear bandits, I get uh, the result, uh, the root k regret with polynomial dependence on all the MDP parameters. Um, so finally, um, to conclude, we were the first to study this aggregate bandit feedback uh, in the adversarial setup. Uh, we presented a, a, a computationally efficient algorithm with root k regret. Um, what's next? Um, the polynomial dependencies on the number of states, action, and the horizon are far from optimal. It will be interesting to try and uh, improve them. Also, there's a very different model uh, than finite horizon MDPs that calls stochastic shortest path. Stochastic shortest path is sort of more suitable to model uh, games and so on because um, the episode doesn't end after exactly h time steps. It ends once I get to some very special goal state or sync state. So once I win the game or lose the game, uh, and this, uh, it turns out that this um, uh, control over the length of the episode makes everything much more complicated because I need to also minimize uh, minimize the length of the episode as well as the uh, the total cost. Uh, and if if I don't see the loss during the episode, which can be very 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 long, at least initially, uh, then there's nothing I can optimize with in the middle of the episode. I can r run indefinitely uh, while, while getting a very large cost. So it's very unclear how to uh, to do this with this feedback model. And also we can consider like other feedback models and other reward structures on MDP. So for example, what happens um, if I only get like win or lose by the end of the episode? This is NP hard, but maybe it can be uh, easy under some assumptions and so on. And this is other things that we're looking at. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. So now that we sort of understand the TV partially, okay. can we go back to the motivation? Because we gave a very strong motivation, but I don't see any relation to the motivation. The motivation is, uh, the motivation is, is uh, I agree, it's very loose. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a very good uh, starting point to at, at sort of approaching this problem of sparse rewards because it's a very hard problem. Uh, we don't have any sort of um, well-grounded techniques to handle this thing. Um, and actually, when we started looking at this thing, we wanted to solve stochastic short path with this uh, feedback model. And this turned out to be very hard. And once again, this is just the first, uh, uh, first step towards uh, approaching uh, a, a complete solution. I agree with you that the motivation is loose. I still think we, we got a very nice algorithm. We learned something uh, very important about um, so at, uh, attacking these uh, feed, this, uh, um, harder feedback models. I don't even see how in the motivation there is a relation between the fact that you have adversarial loss the motivation. I mean, what do you mean? The story itself. Okay. Well, what's a, what's adversarial the there? It's it's fixed. The loss there is fixed. The loss uh, in um, in Montezuma's revenge it's it's fixed. But if you if you consider intrinsic rewards, which you uh, you can uh, choose yourself or try to learn them, okay? Then these rewards can can be arbitrary, right? It uh, depends on how you play the game or how, how, you, how you choose uh, the, the learning algorithm and so on. It's, uh, it, it's not fixed, not at all. The extrinsic reward is fixed, I agree. But the intrinsic reward, it's up to you. You can choose whatever you want, as long as it helps you learn. Assume that someone fixed the loss for you, right? Uh, the, the loss sequence is arbitrary. 
right? It's not it's a, right, but someone is living into it. It's not right. So who is you going to give you the nutrients of trust? The, the engineer of uh, the learning system, right? So you can somehow, by the end of the episode, just quantify <laughs> what the loss was. <laughs> what do you mean? It's not adversarial. It's, uh, but you, you don't, you can't assume that it's fixed or stochastic as well. So what, what are you going to assume? But uh, I, I, in every other entity, then, it's, it depends on the state and tension. Uh, okay, let's take it offline. I disagree, but let's take it offline. Okay, so again, thank you a lot. Uh -huh.